we are really trying to change the world. And I hope over the coming days, with the talks that we will have that talk about our privacy technologies, with the talks that we will have that talk about, you know, the scaling and how we plan to hit these things. Research Lab is going to be coming up here. We're going to be talking about different... We, we know we're not perfect. We know we have so much room to improve. And we're not going to make grandiose claims that we've got 100% privacy, we've got this 100%, you know. No. Because if you don't iterate, if you don't improve, especially in this space, right, you're going to get out. And we know that. In fact, we love that. We embrace that because we want to get better. As the world changes, we want to change. Because we are here to help people for the first time in a long time to have hard currency. Currency that you can choose what to do with. That people can't come and say, okay, you need to do this with it, you need to do this with it, you need to show your records over who you share it with. This is, to, to coin a hashtag just on the spot, the Monero difference. When we talk about things like Bitcoin and kind of their, their open ledger, and we talk about you know, on-chain governance and all this different type of stuff, this is what sets Monero apart. And if you have any questions about any of these things, we've got people ready to answer these questions over here. Come to our tables. We've got free stuff. Please take all our free stuff. If we go home with any of our free stuff, we'll be very disappointed. Take all of it. We don't want any of it. Okay? And tell your friends to come take all this free stuff. If this seems a bit improv, I do apologize. It is. Okay? Because the guy that's supposed to give the, the opening speech, we don't really know who he is. We don't know who was supposed to give the opening speech. I'll be honest. But that's actually one of the funny things, and that's one of the things that sets Monero apart. We are very decentralized. We didn't have an ICO. We didn't have a pre-mine. We have no corporation, foundation, any of this type of thing. It's just a bunch of people that are passionate about privacy, passionate about hard currency, about research, about furthering the privacy conversation globally, that are just all getting together to make this happen. And that shows in the, in the creation of the village and how we do this stuff as well. Because it's been chaotic. If you, if you were not there, it's all open, it's all online. IRC logs, Taiga, all this different type of stuff. It, it was a bit of a chaos getting all this together. Nobody really in charge. But it was fun. And we did it. And maybe it's not going to be the best village that ever was, but we're going to learn for next year. And this is really what highlights the greatness of the Monero community, is we are so passionate about decentralization that we don't know who's giving the opening speech, and we don't know why this person was given an hour for an opening speech. I'm also giving the closing speech, and they asked me, do you want two hours? And I said, no. What am I going to talk about for two hours? Um, but, uh, so I've decided I'm going to have a game show. And there's going to be prizes. So if any of you guys wants to be a part of this game show, and we can, it's just going to be some trivia stuff, stuff that you're probably going to be learning over the course of these next three days if you attend our talks. Please come talk to me. I'd be thrilled to have you guys on stage. We're going to have some great, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have some, a lot of fun. All right, so what? I've, I've burned like four minutes. I've got another 56 minutes to go. Okay, I'm not going to speak for an hour. Well, we've got much better people than me that are going to be speaking. Um, like HYC, our keynote speaker. Uh, we've got Monero Research Lab. Over the course of the, of, of the three days, we're going to have plenty of people on these tables. We've got plenty of uh, very exciting people like Tari and Globy who are working to build a second layer solution on top of Monero, that type of thing. We've got Monero Research Lab. Um, Kavri, um, Anonymous here. I don't know if every, anybody knows the, about Kavri and how it's working. If you don't, please come to the talks. You can find out. See, the Monero community is not just about, okay, we're going to make Monero make the price as big as it possibly can be trying to see how can we further the privacy conversation all across the world. And this even includes altruistic stuff like Kavri, which is talking, which is a I2P router uh, made in C++. And we want it to be available for any application, not just Monero that wants to use it. Because we realize that some people need that extra privacy. Some people need that extra you know, routing through, I, through the I2P network to avoid any number of things. And we want to just give that freely to anybody, not just for coins to implement, but for anyone to implement. We are so focused, we are so passionate about hard currency to the world that we will do, I mean, we will do basically anything to get there. Don't take that the wrong way, okay? But uh, by all means, tell your friends that we're here, record the speeches, do whatever you need to do, ask questions, ask, ask questions. We love questions, and we are always willing to talk with people about how Monero is going to change the world. We also got BCOS with us. Um, I don't think anybody from them is here at the moment. Uh, BCOS stands for the 
blockchain, cryptocurrency, open security. They've also got some cool swag to give away. I think most of their t-shirts are gone. This, this stuff goes fast, man. We, we, got, we got a plan. We got, my goodness. Lesson learned. Okay, there they are. Because people, these guys coming in, they're, they're giving stuff. Oh, let's give them a look, look, and there are partners here. Um, go talk to them, see what they're all about, doing great stuff. Yeah, uh, I don't think I, don't I think could I talk, talk for that, that much longer, longer. Uh, but, but does it, just first of all, does anybody have any questions about the agenda, about anything that we're doing? Let's, let's turn this to a Q&A. What, what do you guys think? Hmm? What do you guys think? I'm sorry? The next speaker is right there. That's Howard Chu. He's going to be speaking at 11. I mean, he, he brought a fiddle and he can like play for the, for the interim. Uh, there was a question over there? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so the sure. So the question, the question is, um, and I don't know how many of these questions I'm going to do because a lot of these things are going to be in talks and stuff like that. But sure, I'm more than happy to talk about this. Uh, so the, the question was, for those that didn't hear, that there has been some disagreements within the Monero community about ASIC resistance. You know, how, how, cause so for those who don't know, Monero is committed to be ASIC resistant. And if you don't know what that is, please, by all means, come talk to us over there. We're more than happy to answer questions about that. But that requires that every, so every six months, we, we, Monero does a hard fork anyway to kind of upgrade the network and add new technologies. Like this upcoming hard fork, we're putting bulletproofs, shrinks our range proofs by a lot, lots of cool stuff. Talk to Monero Research Lab. But as part of our six months um, hard forks, we are changing our hashing algorithm. We are slightly tweaking, slightly tweaking, slightly tweaking to keep ASICs away. Now the argument is that this brings in an element of centralization because who's, who's calling the shots up here? Right? Who's saying, well, we're switching, we're switching it to this, this or we're, we're switching it all? And, and what, what parameters we're, we're tweaking and all that different type of stuff. stuff. So, so the thing the that thing most people don't understand about decentralization, decentralization period is it's not just like one big all-encompassing mass of decentralization. You have decentralization of development, of community, decentralization of the protocol, all this different type of stuff, right? And it's, yes, so, so it's really tough to kind of give up. This, this coin is coin five out of 10 decentralized, decentralized. Seven, seven out of 10, 10 decentralized. Because really, you have, you to, have look to look at, look at these things individually, individually these, different these different areas of decentralization, decentralization and see, and see okay, okay, how decentralized is this portion, is this portion, is this portion. portion. So the so counter argument to this ASIC, ASIC thing is that, that if, if Monero doesn't fork away from ASICs, then there's going to be centralization of mining. There's going to be centralization of the work like we see for Bitcoin today. And so no matter, it's almost like a catch-22. No matter what you do, there's going to be some form of centralization. Either centralization of who's, who's making these tweaks, who's doing the development, that type of stuff, who's doing that type of thing, or centralization of, of, the, of the mining. And at the moment, nobody really has hard solutions for this. Everyone's got ideas, and that's great. Let's try different ideas. Let's, all of this stuff really is an experiment at its core. Bitcoin is an experiment at its core. Monero is an experiment at its core. We're, trying to, we're very young, and we're trying to see how can we change the world. And along the way, there's going to be snags. Along the way, we're, we're not, we don't claim to know everything, but we're trying stuff out. We're seeing, we're seeing how it goes. And in this particular case, the Monero core team, seven individuals who, uh, they, they actually don't do any development. If you want to learn more about Monero's governance, we got good stuff on our website. Come talk to any of us over here. We've decided, you know what, we're going to try for the centralization temporarily in terms of development until ASICs become such a commodity that anyone can have one. And at that point, for the security, we can go ahead and switch to an ASIC-friendly algorithm, the one, that, the one that everybody has one. Everyone's got it on their phone. Everyone's got it on their something. So it's not a plan to fork every six months till the end of time forever. Right? It's just the idea that temporarily letting ASICs on the network is really going to be detrimental to everybody else that's wanting to mine. And we want to be as decentralized as possible in that area. Um, and long term, and long -term we, are we are looking to make, we're, 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 we're looking at different solutions. HYC here like had, a, had a, a thing called RandomJS random that, that he came up with. Up it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another take on proof of work entirely. entirely. And, it's and it's really cool. cool. And, and, and it's, it's going to be implemented, implemented into WowNero, wow Nero, which is kind of the Dogecoin of Monero, the testbed of Monero. To look it up, wownero.com. And you know they're probably going to implement it, and we're going to see how it goes. Does that answer your question? OK, great. Any other questions? Okay, okay, so, so if you, if have, you not, have not, there is a blog post that's put out by Seacoin. 
because, because they, they um, um, for those who don't know, Sierra Coin was kind of trying to be ASIC friendly and come up with their own ASIC first. So that way, just everyone can have one and not just monopolies by different people. And along the way, they learned many, many lessons about kind of how ASICs work, kind of how computing works and stuff. And people here may be in different levels of knowledge. I know I am. There are some things I'm strong in, some things I'm not strong in. But the idea is that you can always optimize for one particular algorithm, but then on the other side, in terms of general computing, it doesn't do as well. So on a spectrum of 0 to 10, a CPU, that our computer, is very inefficient, but the benefit, the benefit is it can do, do a whole bunch, bunch of stuff, stuff right? right? So then, so then alternatively, alternatively, you can, you can optimize, optimize for just, for just one, one thing, thing, but then but it does general things very poorly. poorly. And, that's and that's that spectrum that, spectrum that we're, we're looking at. at. So FPGAs, FPGAs are kind of that, that, in, that in that center area. area. Normally, Normally, you're not going to see anything in that center area, area because if you're going to go general, you're just going to go all the way general. If you're going to go application specific, you're just going to go all the way application specific. So you're on either end of the extreme. FPGAs are kind of in that center, so that way they're kind of reprogrammable to be able to do that type of thing. And there's nothing we can really do to stop that. There are all, obviously alternative things such as proof of stake, which we don't like for various reasons, and we can get into those at another time. There are ways of trying to uh, secure the blockchain. But at the moment, we feel that proof of work really is the greatest way that we're doing that at the moment. And this is for economic reasons as well as for um, cryptographic reasons. And, and in terms, terms of proof of work, work there's, there's not really that, that much, there's not an answer to FPGAs. But, but, but we, we just want GPUs and CPUs to still be, still be somewhat competitive, competitive as, as opposed to, to um, if there's an ASIC, really, really you can't just be, com you can't be competitive at all. So the part so somewhat of a uh, still of a threat, I guess you could say. I, I, I think the word a bit strong here. They are somewhat of a threat, but nowhere near as much as ASICs, and we want it to be as decentralized and competitive as possible in that regard. Does that make sense, everybody? Did I answer your question? Anybody else have any questions? Say one more time. Group mining. Say again. Mining pools. Okay. Right. So, so pool mining, of course, if if you have several pools that control the majority of the hash rate, then they can collude and perform fifty-one percent attacks together they have 51% of the network, right? So this, this is definitely something, and it exists, and what can you do about it? Well, you know, there has been some talks in Monero, like what, what, what if we were to propose a sort of algorithm of sort of pool, it's, it's similar to pool mining, but you mine individually, in, uh, because so the idea behind pool mining is that everyone gives their hashes to a pool who submits it to the network, period. So all the hashes come from the pool. Thank you very much. All the hashes come from the pool. Whereas, Whereas what if all the hashes, hashes came from the individuals, but the payout is still to a pool? Does that make sense? So that way it, it decentralizes in that way, so the hashes come from individuals, but it pays out to a pool, which gets, then gets distributed depending on how many, hash, uh, how many shares that you put in like that. So that, you know, there, there's discussion things that we're talking about in terms of that, but once again, these things are pretty far down the line in my opinion, and none of this stuff is set in stone. There's, nobody has really solved any of these problems. Cryptocurrency is so new, nine years, pretty soon here, Bitcoin came out nine years ago, pretty soon here. Um, and because we're so young, that's actually what makes uh, cryptocurrency such an exciting field to be a part of. This is the new frontier. This is something that could, that like, you, you, if it's not been done before, go and go try it. Let's, let's tweak it, let's tinker with it. it. This is like what the internet was, my gosh, is it just like, what, 30, 40 years ago? I, I didn't, I didn't see, see the rise of the internet. I'm too, and so it's up to you, like HYC. HYC basically coded the internet. Just, just so you know. I'm done. <laughs> your question? OK. Did they, any other question? Sorry, this is discombobulated open speech, but. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah, this, this is this is definitely something like we never know who's compromised, the core team compromised, the developers compromised, that type of stuff. And really, we just have to rely on the principles of open source, keeping the code just available for anyone to look at. And this is this is for the core implementation uh, that is stewarded by the core team. Anyone can make their own implementation and and close source it. Anyone can make their own wallets and just keep it close source. Anyone and the Monero community 
Anytime there's anything proprietary that is, that is proposed, the Monero community says, you know what, we, we really are not a fan of this and we don't recommend that anybody use this. Anything that is not open, we don't recommend it. And so there was this wallet, Cake Wallet, and they were for the iOS and they were very exciting because they were one of, one of the first iOS wallets for Monero. You can go to cakewallet.com and take a look at it. And the guy who launched it didn't, wasn't really, he wasn't malicious, but he didn't really know a lot about open source ethos. And so it was proprietary. And the community, there was a big pushback from the community and said, we would love it if you open source this code. And he did. He, he was like, okay, I hear, I hear all this feedback. And so he open sourced the code. Everyone can look at it. And now it's one of the most recommended iOS wallets in Monero. So we, we really put, we really stick to the open source ideals. And we really stick to the idea that everyone should be able to audit the code themselves to make sure that nothing malicious is running on their machines. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. yes. The ring signatures? Right. right, and, and, and it's, really it's really hard to tell hard which, which is going to be the case with any given thing that comes from any source, source right? right? And, and at, this at this point, all we can do with Monero is see how do, how do we improve? How do we how make do it better? better? And the, the, the idea is that even when we're not hearing this stuff that people are, are cracking the cryptography and, and breaking the ring signatures and stuff like that, even when we're not hearing that, we have to assume that people are trying to do it silently. So we are always looking to improve. Always, always looking to increase our ring size, or maybe move away from a ring signature scheme altogether if something comes along that is still trustless and doesn't require trusted setup, right? So we are always looking to make things better. As an example, bulletproofs, um, the biggest part of the, because, okay, let's start here. Because Monero implements so, many, so much privacy technology on top of a typical Bitcoin transaction, the transactions are typically much bigger than Bitcoin ones, right? And the, and the large, large portion, portion of that is taken by our range, range proofs, which is proving that the number falls between a certain set, a certain range, right? right. Bulletproofs, Bulletproofs is something that was very recently come up with by Bunce. Uh, I don't know, I don't know his name. But uh, we, Monero Research Lab, we looked into it, we coded an implementation, we got it audited, and it's going to be replacing our current range proofs. And it's going to reduce transaction sizes by about 80%. And what are we doing with the savings? We're looking to potentially up the ring size. This isn't set in stone yet, but we're looking to potentially up the ring size as a result. So instead of mixing with six other people around you, you're going to be 10 other people. So we're using savings to increase the privacy. Because ultimately, yes, this does come down to glorified statistics, wherein you say, okay, what is the probabilities and what are the statistics that this guy mixed with this guy, this guy mixed with this guy, the sources and time. And this is something that, that we're talking about. If sources and time, like, like sometimes, sometimes like a passive like surveillance. You could, you could potentially map out, out all of this stuff. stuff. But, but it, it's still based on heuristics, heuristics and it's still based on probabilities where you say, okay, well, we can be 50% sure, 40% sure. I mean, when it comes to practical real world use case, that, is that enough for a jury? Is that enough in the court system? Who knows, who can say? All, and, and at that point, it's kind of out of our hands as a Monero community. All we can do is just keep looking to improve and get better and better and better. And, and we want to be like Tor. We don't want to say, like, we are the one-stop shop for privacy, right? Tor tells you, you need to change some of your browsing habits. You need to change how you do some of your things and be careful with some of your information. That could Monero is the same. We're going like, uh, we're actually currently working on the Monero Hatch work group is working on a best practices type thing, how to use your Monero effectively. And we're moving to, because people can't do stupid things like choose a typical ring size. Instead of mixing with seven people, which is the default, they can choose to mix with 23 people. And if you do that every single time, now all of a sudden those transactions are linked. Does that make sense? So we're trying to come up with best practices, recommendations, here's how to use Monero effectively so you can still be private. Does that answer the question? Okay. okay. Anyone, Anyone else? else? Of course. Okay. okay. So we so are going to be talking, talking about this about in depth, depth in many of our speeches. I can give a very, very, very brief uh, idea. How does the question is how does Monero differ from Bitcoin? So this, this is very loaded. This is very big. Bitcoin is it's built on the blockchain protocol, right? technology, but at its core, it, it's open and transparent by default. You can put some Bitcoin invest that numeric string into a block, how much Bitcoin that has, 
and every, every single transaction it's ever done. done. So, so how many times it's received, how many times it's sent, that different type of stuff, right? To us, this is the equivalent of posting your bank statement or your PayPal statement or whatever online every month for anyone to see. And if I was to ask people, would you feel comfortable showing me your bank statement? The answer for everyone is pretty much no. Especially if I'm like, okay, I'm going to share this on my social media, I'm going to post this online for everyone to see. This is basically what Bitcoin is doing. And so a lot of people are looking at Bitcoin like it can deliver us from the state or, you know, people are in it for different reasons. But really this allows for an unprecedented level of surveillance into people's finances if Bitcoin ever gains real traction. Because they can, even though it's very difficult to, even though it's an alphanumeric string and not a name that's on there, if you can link that string to a person, then you can know how much money Bitcoin that person has at any given time. Monero loves blockchain, blockchain technology and all the benefits that it brings, but this becomes unacceptable to us from a privacy perspective, from a I control my own data perspective. And so we decided, you know, we're going to encrypt the, well, not encrypt, there's a lot of different technologies, we're going to be talking about them soon. The sender, the receiver, and the amount. So that way the blockchain is still open for anyone to view, but unless you have the private key, like I think of it as a specific magnifying glass that's looking across the blockchain, only you can see your transactions. Only you can see how much money that you have. And this has real world ramifications. Dangerous ones. If I'm traveling someplace in the third world that's known for criminal, the, for criminal activity, and I go to a taco stand, I love tacos, okay? I go to a taco stand and I purchase something with Bitcoin, that, per, that vendor sees this much Bitcoin coming from this address. And he can put it from, because I paid him there, into a block explorer and say, hey, this guy's got a thousand Bitcoin. He's loaded. I'm going to send my cousins, and we're going to mug and torture this guy until he gives us his private keys. Right? So there's real world ramifications for this. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, another question. Yes, so blockchain analysis is becoming bigger and bigger with every passing day. And there are ways that they're coming up with, and whether they tell you or not, to link for addresses because it's still open. So you see it go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here. I guess it could be any number of things, but especially if, because you buy Bitcoin with IC AML exchange, right? So you have to give your stuff. And then if you put it through 10 addresses, and then you take out your Bitcoin also through a KYC AML exchange, they can be reasonably sure that you basically just send it to yourself a bunch of times. And that's a very simple heuristic that I'm giving you. They have much more advanced ones in statistics to try to link transactions across the blockchain. But this also means, because the best practice is that you save all of your private keys that you use just in case you left your Bitcoin, some Bitcoin here and there. So even if you have burner addresses, maybe, I found some Monero in a wallet that I totally forgot about. You know what I'm saying? And so if you, if you generate 1,000 addresses in an attempt to be private that is actually not very good, it's best practice to keep 1,000 of these private keys just in case. Whereas with Monero, you keep one private key, you secure it well, and as well, nobody can see. So why go through all this trouble of generating address after address after address after address, after address in a eh way of trying to keep your privacy when there's something like Monero that you don't have to go through any of these extra steps and does it by default. That, that would be my answer to that question. Yes. Is it possible to detect them? Yeah, okay, and this is, this is one of my personal misgivings with Monero. Okay, actually one of the benefits of Bitcoin is that anyone can audit and make sure that the supply is exactly how we think it's going to be. Okay? Um, and when you have technology that's perfectly blinding, so with meaning that nobody can see, there is a potential that if someone cracks the cryptography, the privacy itself won't necessarily be broken. What can be broken is somebody can send themselves an infinite amount of Monero or Zcash or any of this type of stuff and nobody would be able to notice because it's an encrypted blockchain. How, how do you see? Right? And so the, the, this, is, this is a legitimate concern potentially with Monero and with any of these private cryptocurrencies where you say, okay, but is this worth the trade-off? Are we willing to be transparent to the potential of surveillance so that we can audit it? Or 
are we are we willing to trust in the cryptography? Of course, if Monero's cryptography is cracked, Monero uses battle-tested cryptography. If Monero's cryptography is cracked, I think the least of our concerns is what's going to be happening to Monero because, like, internet and passwords and all this different type of stuff is because it relies on commonly used ellipt elliptical curve cryptography. So if that's broken, I mean, we're screwed in a lot of different ways, you know? So uh, some, that, that is something that's often brought up, and that's a that legitimate thing that I can see. That's a legitimate concern that I can see. How can we verify? How can we... And the idea is that the protocol only allows certain things, and as long as... And if it doesn't allow the... If you send a transaction that, that does not adhere to those guidelines, then the, the network is going to reject it. And so we can be really sure that everyone participating in the network is operating within these guidelines. And so we can look at the Coinbase transactions. For those who don't know it, Coinbase is not just the name of a company. It's the term for when a new Monero is minted, when new Monero is minted and given to miners. We can add up all of the Coinbase transactions and see how much we expect there to be in existence. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, and see, Arctic Mine is going to be talking about this when he gives his speech. Arctic Mine is a core uh, team Monero member. He could say hi. Just go ahead and raise your hand. He's going to be talking about this in this speech. Monero is not a fixed current. Uh, it doesn't have a fixed supply. There is a small tail emission at the end. So after all of the Monero is issued, there's going to be 0 0.3 Monero per block. I mean, per, per minute. So 0 0.6 per block. That is going to be issued ever after indefinitely. And because it's a static amount and not a percentage, over time, as the amount of Monero goes up, the percentage inflation is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And as well, people are going to be losing their private keys, which lessens the overall amount of Moneros and stuff. So over time, we expect those two things to, to roughly equal. So that way, in total, no new Monero is going to enter the system, per se. And he's going to be talking more about that because we've got a dynamic blockchain, um, not sorry, blockchain, a dynamic block size that depends on the, the tail emission and stuff. He's got great stuff to say about all that different type of stuff. How much time do I have left? <laughs> yes. Is Monero... You, you, oh, okay. It is like UTXO, except they're not called UTXOs. They're just called TTXOs because the U stands for something, and somebody will be able to better answer this question than I. Okay, and you cannot say you cannot see which one is unspent in Monero. Is the idea? So we just call them TXOs. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. of quantum, quantum computing, computing and, and, and the threat, threat that that poses? Is, is that, that's, that's the question? question? Okay. okay. So, so the, the, the question, question was, just was, for, I, I, I keep forgetting to repeat these questions for the video and for stuff like that. The question was, is there anything that we can do to kind of prepare for the upcoming quantum computing threat kind of to Monero and stuff? And you know what, dude? Quantum computing, it's, it's coming along. Nobody really knows how powerful it is, how powerful it's going to be, what the cap is. And so it's re anyone who says, we, we're quantum resistant, we're good to all this different type of stuff, they don't know. We don't know. Like, over, we're, we're coming little by little, and we're all learning as we go. So in the event that it happens, it, it, MRL, Monero Research Lab, is looking into this type of stuff. And they're saying, OK, what, what, what are some feasible things that we can do? What is reading some papers, keeping on top of all the latest research on the subject? But at the moment, we don't have any real recommendations because we have no idea like what quantum computing is capable of, or if it will ever become as widespread as we think it will, we might be. It might be a bust. A lot of things are a bust. You know what I'm saying? So anyway. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if it will do what we think it will do, then it could potentially break elliptical curve cryptography, which, once again, we're in for a slew of problems, not just Monero, right? If that's broken, because everything's based on ETC now. OK, there was one other hand that I missed. It was somewhere in this area of the something or others. No? OK. Then, any other questions? Any last minute questions? Yes. I do not, and and let me tell you why. Okay. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead in terms of this village here, and I'm gonna tell you guys about something called fungibility. Who's heard of that word? Okay. Okay. Fungible, Fungible basically just means that one of something equals, equals another of the same, same something. something. And I'll give you an example so it makes sense. If you have a dollar, and I have a dollar, and we exchange dollars, 
We now have different dollars, but no transfer of value has taken place. We both have one dollar. So one of the issues with Bitcoin's transparentness, okay, is that if a Bitcoin goes through an illicit transaction, like a darknet market transaction, any of that type of stuff, I'm not giving commentary on what I think of all those things, but like, let's say it does, right? It becomes a tainted Bitcoin. And it, you know, even if you had nothing to do with that transaction, let's say they transacted over there, did that thing, and then this guy buys a t-shirt from me. Now I have this Bitcoin, right? Because I gave him that t-shirt. Now all of a sudden, who knows who's gonna come knocking on my door. Hey, you have a Bitcoin and you're suspicious. You're a suspicious person. And maybe civil forfeiture, we're gonna go ahead and take that Bitcoin as evidence, right? So because tainted Bitcoins have this history associated with them, they can, some people are willing to get rid of them at a discount, so that way they can have a better Bitcoin, right? So I'm willing to sell my one Bitcoin for 0 0.9 Bitcoins. Because I know that these 0 0.9 I can spend any, won't lose it, it's a civil forfeiture. Whereas, some people are willing to pay a premium for newly minted Bitcoins because they have no history associated with them. Right? And we see this, we see this in the real world as well. Whereas, let's say I have two cool little trinkets, right? Two trinkets that are exactly the same, but I can prove 100% that one of them uh, belongs to somebody famous. Napoleon, Lady Gaga, it doesn't matter, right? Now, all of a sudden, even though these are the exact same thing, the price of the one that is associated with somebody famous just skyrockets. So it's, it's not, not fungible. fungible. One, one does not, not equal one. one. And so, so with, with the Bitcoin, Bitcoin example, if you have a Bitcoin and I have a Bitcoin and we just exchange Bitcoins one to one, maybe a transfer of value has taken place. If I gave you a tainted one and you gave me a clean one, yours could potentially be worth less. So Bitcoin is not fungible. One does not necessarily equal one. And this makes some people nervous because anonymity is a technical requirement for fungibility. Because, because you can't see where it's been and you don't care. The, the dollar example, the cash in your hand, you don't know where it's been, you don't care where it's been. All you know is that you can spend it at any place and get a dollar's worth of stuff. And Bitcoin's not like that. Merchants don't wanna have to check every single Bitcoin transaction to see if they're getting something bad and if they're getting less than what they should be getting, right? So Monero solves that problem with privacy by default and mandatory. So all the coins look the same. You don't know where they've been, you don't know where they're going, and you don't care. And a lot of the other privacy coins, Zcash, Dash, all these other ones that have different claims to fame, right? they implement privacy optionally, opt-in. You have to choose the privacy option. And when this happens, inevitably, only a small fraction of the transactions end up using the privacy feature. And really what that does is it makes those ones stick out like a sore thumb. So if I'm a regular guy, and I transparent transaction, transparent transaction, transparent transaction, private transaction, they're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. What were you doing there that it needed to be private? You were doing transparent, 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 and now private all of a sudden? So in a sense, that also hurts the fungibility because they could say, the government or whoever, could, okay, we will not accept any coin that has been through a private transaction in the past 10, 11, whatever. So now all of a sudden, if you have one of those, you can't spend it in some places. Maybe you can't use it in some countries. With Monero, it's all or nothing. They can either say, you cannot use Monero, period, or you can use Monero. So uh, I'm not really a fan. I'm not a, a Monero maximalist per se. I'm a privacy advocate first and foremost. I am all about privacy. And, be, and it's because I'm a privacy advocate that I'm for Monero. And it's really easy to make a competitor to Monero. All you have to do is make a coin that is private by default and mandatory with good research going down and privacy uh, uh, technology uh, competently implemented. But nobody's done that yet. Everybody makes, everybody makes optionally, transfer, optionally private transactions. And so because of that, no other coin is fungible. I, I, this may sound strange to hear, and I'm saying, gonna say it very bluntly. I do not think there is another cryptocurrency in the real sense except for because of that fungibility issue. That because most of the coins are forked off from Bitcoin, inherit that transparent ledger. Because the other private coins only do optionally, optional privacy, it's not fungible. There is no other coin that is actually a currency than Monero. You can make one, just make it private by default and mandatory. I want Monero to have competition. That will spur everybody onward. That will make everybody keep going. That monopolies are bad, right? 
Make, make more, more of these things. things. Please, Please, by, by all, all means, that'll further the research. research. That'll, that'll further the everything. everything. But, but, but like, but don't, 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 like, do it halfway. halfway. Do, do what's what needed to be done. done. Yes. 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 Zcash. Zcash. Right. If Zcash, Zcash was to, imp was, if Zcash Zcash was to implement ev everything needs to be a shielded transaction, transaction, then that would definitely help with its fungibility. It still, it still has, has a trusted, trusted setup, setup, so we, we say, say eh, eh, but. but. Mobile devices, devices using that type of thing, thing. right? right. So ultimately, so ultimately, this is a conversation that probably needs to be had um, with some of our table people. I'd love to hear your opinion. Come talk with me afterwards. Look, we'll, we'll discuss it. That's totally fine. I'm totally down with this. But in the meantime, any other questions? Yes. Yes. OK, so uh, we have a cool little banner back there for the Monero Research Lab. They're not here right now, but they will be manning that table sometime soon. The Monero Research Lab is part of the Monero Project. Uh, the, uh, Monero the Monero Project, project let's, let's, let's take a take step, step back, back here. here. The Monero, Monero project, project is kind of an umbrella that is, that is stewarded by the core team of Monero, Monero that um, Kavri, Monero, Monero Research, Research Lab, Lab, the Monero, Monero coin itself. itself. It's basically it's a suite, suite of softwares and a suite, suite of research, research that happens by people that um, want to further privacy. privacy. And it's very decentralized, you know, there's no leaders, there's no bosses, there's no corporation, there's no foundation. So the Monero Research Lab is a group of researchers that get together and they read the papers and they do their own research and, and they, we are, we're actually putting out a paper on a new multi-signature scheme and stuff like that uh, to further Monero and further privacy, period. They, so they, they check all the latest research and stuff. And they, so Monero, because it didn't take a pre-mine, uh, pre an ICO or anything like that, this is one of the very interesting parts. Maybe I'm going too, too, too deep into this, but, and I, this would actually be very, very, um, for the crowd that's here, I think this would be very appreciated. Because they did not take a pre-mine, there's no ICO, there's no foundation, there's no corporation, or people just giving money to anyone willy-nilly, whenever something needs to be funded in Monero, whenever something needs money, that person literally makes a proposal and said, hey, I, I'm willing for 50 Monero to work for three months or to make a series of videos or something like that. And they give it to the community and they say, will you fund me? And if the community likes the project, they will donate Monero so that person can do what they said they're going to do. Which, 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 that, that's, that's incredible. incredible. We, we, we don't have anybody just handing out money, money and, and we don't, we don't take, take a tax, tax on the, on the, on the, the, um, on the block reward or anything like that. that. So the so Monero, Monero Research Lab, we have two PhD researchers, researchers that every, every three months they put a proposal, proposal um, um, Saray and Sarang, uh, uh, Brandon and Aaron, you'll get to meet them if you go by the table a little later on. They are funded by the community, competitive salaries to just do a bunch of research on privacy technologies in Monero. So that's, so that's who the Monero Research Lab, the, the, those people are kind of the, the leaders of the Monero Research Lab. They're not anyone's boss per se because we don't have that formal structure, but everyone greatly respects them and we, and we, we follow their recommendations generally. And this is something you're going to commonly find throughout all of Monero is that there's no explicit leadership structure, there's no formalized anything. It's just a bunch of organic groups forming together. If there's a bunch of designers, they're going to all get together and say, let's design something. If there's a bunch of marketers, they're gonna all get together and say, let's market something. A bunch of developers, a bunch of researchers, all that different type of stuff. We call these work groups. And they can have whatever structure they want. Any other questions? No, we're Gucci. All right, dude, what time is it? Somebody give me time. 10.40, oh wow, I actually did pretty good. I mean, so if I, if, I, if, I, if I finish, then it'll be only 20 minutes until HYC's talk, and he's gonna really, did I, just, did I step all over your toes? Oh my God, I am so sorry. I, please forgive me, HYC. He's just gonna come up and say everything I just said again. I'm just kidding, he's gonna do it better. He, he's much more technical, he's a developer, he invented the internet. Uh, that's going about that. So, uh, yeah, once more, big, big welcome to everybody here. Welcome to the Monero Village. Take all of our free stuff. Talk to all of the people. Ask questions. We love that you're here. We're so thrilled to be a part of DEF CON. We're thrilled to be partnered with BCOS and to uh, these guys over here. They got their own table. Talk to them. They're doing great stuff. Uh, please enjoy yourselves. Come on back. Bring your friends. 
Uh, we have three pages. If you go, if you go, if you open the DEF, DEF CON booklet thingy, we have three pages. Our agenda is three pages of talks, just back to back to back talks. So please come, come see all of them. That's it. You are all beautiful people. I love you. Thank you.